Welcome to the Rare Books Department. The philosophy behind the Rare Books Department has long emphasized the importance of the book as a physical object. Some of the most meaningful interactions with the Rare Books collection have occurred in the classroom, where students are able to hold history in their hands. We would now like to extend our reach in order to remain committed to providing reference, research, and educational access by offering new online options for students, faculty, and community members alike. We welcome you to subscribe to the official Rare Books blog, Open Book, and browse our digital exhibitions. Click on the links for more info and enjoy. For hundreds of years, bookmakers and writers have been exploring their creativity, not just in language, but in the style and form of the book itself. I hope that this presentation will encourage you to see the multiple ways in which your own writing can be transformed into unique books or book objects. First, let's start with a brainstorming activity. What do you think of when you hear the word book? What images come to mind? Perhaps you're thinking about a textbook from school, or maybe your favorite copy of Harry Potter. Even if you don't like to read, you might enjoy flipping through magazines or picture books. For most of us, Books have long been a familiar thing, and we've encountered at least one or two of them in our lives. Now, let's switch perspectives a little. What do you think of when you hear the word art? Usually we think of a painting or a sculpture, or perhaps we're more interested in the performative arts, such as music or dance. In most cases, even literature should be considered a type of art. Generally speaking, art is usually depicted in museums or galleries, while also associated as an important part of a country's culture. That being said, do you think that books and art have anything in common? What about the term artist book? If ancient Japanese and Chinese scroll books, hieroglyphics, or illuminated manuscripts come to mind, you are already on the right track. According to British artist Sarah Bodeman, the artist book format has evolved from a combination of many forms of historical and traditional bookmaking, all of which employed a decorative element of text or image as a means to emphasize the contents of the message. But because there's such a variety of examples of artist books and ambiguity as to what makes a book an artist book, there have been a wide range of debate which results in many experts coming up with differing opinions. Let's look at some terms more closely to see if we can figure out what exactly an artist book is. For the remainder of this chapter, we will mainly focus on the last three terms artist book, book art, and book object. You might be saying to yourself now, but I'm not an artist. Rest assured, as these skills of creativity are accessible to all of us, and it will soon become clear just how important they are within an academic setting. As we begin to think more about creating our own artist book, let's start with reflecting on this relationship of text, image, and form as the combination of special characteristics which represent the design of any artist book. These characteristics include structure, sequence, form, intimacy, and ineffability. Let's look at our first example of what might be considered an artist book. This book is one of my personal favorites and my first introduction to the idea of artist books many, many years ago. This is Kenneth Patchen's An Astonished Eye Looks Out of the Air. As you can see, the structure of this book is very standard. It has the rectangular shape, which we are all familiar with, oftentimes about the same size as our face. This book can be described as a chapbook or an inexpensively made small booklet. There are no page numbers in this book, but there is a sequence. This is derived from the chronologically numbered poems, one through 34. The form, or the way the text is laid out on the page, has a lot more going on. The title of the poems appear in black, while the poems themselves appear in red, but it's the backdrop which creates the most striking visual effects. The backdrop, created by a tint block, repeats the title of the book on every page. The variation of typography can be read on a number of different levels, and every reader might have a different interpretation of the poems. I interpret these poems as soldiers marching through a battlefield. What about you? How do you see these poems? 
But can a simple book like this be intimate? Of course, the poems might evoke an emotional response. But upon learning about the origin of this publication, an additional level of intimacy can be gained. An Astonished Eye was one of nine titles published at a conscientious objector's camp in Waldport, Oregon during World War II. Put simply, a conscientious objector is anyone who refuses to join the armed forces or perform military service based on their right of freedom of thought, conscience, or religion. Oftentimes, these conscientious objectors will be put into internment or labor camps during the war to do work of national importance, like forestry. That said, it's incredible that this book and others like it exist. These are all inevitable components that are not addressed within the text itself, but rather through the book as a physical object. Some of you may already have ideas for an artist book, but for many of us, this is still a new concept that requires extra time and attention. Paying attention is easier said than done, especially in a world like ours filled with distractions. With smartphones and TVs, we often forget to pay attention to some of the most important things, like our five senses. In the context of artist books, activating the senses can help derive inspiration for your working narrative. How often do you pay attention to your senses? When was the last time you noticed a savory smell or tasted something exceptionally sweet? Have you ever touched something that was rough and scratchy? What did that feel like? What did it sound like? What sense or senses are most stimulated when you read books? These may seem like simple questions with simple answers, but let's look more closely. Sure, the act of reading does require us to use our eyes following the text along the page, but other senses might be activated as well, with just a little bit of imagination. According to Russian formulist Viktor Shlovsky, the purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived, and not as they are shown. The technique of art is to make objects unfamiliar, to make forms difficult, to increase the difficulty of length and perception. Applying this concept as an exercise for both brainstorming and writing will help you pay attention to details that might otherwise go unnoticed. These details can be crucial in determining the special characteristics of your own artist book because unlike regular books, artist books are able to engage with the senses both figuratively by means of language and literally through the manipulation of structure and form. Depending on the theme of the narrative, an artist book might want to actively engage with specific senses, or even attempt to activate all five. Of the five senses, sight is likely the easiest to engage with while creating an artist book, as there are a number of different ways we can activate the sense without spending too much time, money, or resources. While we can quickly manipulate our book with a splash of color or a complementary illustration on the page, it is important to note that sight is not solely limited to color and image. In a similar way, the style and appearance of the text, known as typography, can engage sight by creating designs with the words themselves. Text can be arranged in new and unique layouts or altered in size and shape, with each variation quite possibly guiding a change in volume, pitch, pace, and tone of reading. In all circumstances, the visual aspects of the artist book should accompany the content of the narrative by emphasizing main ideas, keywords, and motifs. Following sight, the next sense that plays a major role in our reading would be touch. Even a typical book requires a lot of holding and handling, and depending on the size and shape of the book, our reading experience might be totally different. For example, a heavy textbook compared to an information brochure is much more difficult to read while standing up. On the other hand, the thin pages of a magazine do not provide the same kind of support for taking notes as that of a textbook. And if you're reading from a phone or a laptop, you don't have to flip any pages, but rather you scroll with your fingers or mouse. Without realizing, every time we read and interact with objects such as books, brochures, magazines, and phones, our sense of touch is being stimulated with information about texture, weight, and shape. Much like the visual aspects just mentioned, the tactile features can also enhance a reader's experience in an immense way. Unlike sight and touch, our sense of hearing is not typically discussed when we refer to reading. In most contexts, what we hear is totally unrelated to what we read. 
However, it is difficult to imagine complete silence while reading, as there is often background noise. Other students chatting nearby, maybe the television is on, or perhaps the radio. You might even be one of those readers who puts on a set of headphones and settles into a good book. Hearing is, of course, one of the most important senses we have because it is what first allowed us to communicate with each other. It is the origin of language itself. Surprisingly, hearing can also be associated with reading. Have you ever listened to the sound the page makes when you turn it over? How might this affect your reading experience? How might it influence the way you read and interpret a narrative? The final two senses, taste and smell, are without a doubt the most unlikely perceptions we would engage with while reading, but they should not be disregarded completely. There are still a number of ways these senses can be activated without the reader making a snack of the book. Taste and smell are predominantly linked, as taste is often triggered by activating the smell. There are certain smells that can incite memories or thoughts, and it is possible to incorporate these smells into the reading experience. Some of the most common smells we recognize are sweet and fruity, or floral and herbal. These fragrances are often associated with women's perfume. Other aromas are reminiscent of different types of foods and drinks, like lemon, mint, chocolate, or coffee. There are also scents that are not so pleasant, such as moldy wood, sweat, garlic, and gasoline. Incorporating smell and taste into your artist book may or may not be the direction that you want to go, but it is important to note it as another option to consider. The next example is Alicia Bailey's Animal Mineral Vegetable Book Number One. Unlike an astonished eye, the structure of this book is not standard, but rather it takes on a strange organic shape. The material of the book is also different from the standard paper we are used to. Instead, it is made with mica, copper foil, Tyvek, thread, seed fluff, moths, and butterflies. Although the book is still traditionally bound, and there are pages to flip through, there are no page numbers to determine sequence. In fact, there is no text at all, so the characteristics of form need to be reanalyzed. How might we read this book? In this case, we can refer to our senses. Immediately, the sense of touch is activated because Alicia Bailey's book doesn't feel like a book. It doesn't have the same weight of a book, nor do the pages have the same texture of a book. Similarly, because there is no text other than the title, our eyes have to focus on different details, like the colors and shapes produced by the organic components enclosed between the plastic. Unlike a book bound with paper, this book does not produce any sound. The silence will force the reader to once again refocus attention and perhaps heighten the power of other senses, like smell. Although this book lacks a striking smell, the senses of smell and taste can be evoked through the organic materials present. The butterflies and other components might represent something like a wet summer day, alluding to the smell of wet earth and grass. So simply by looking at the book, the memory which comes from smell can be activated. While there are a number of literary devices that writers can employ to make their stories unique and powerful, I'll focus on the four which I believe to be the most beneficial to the challenges of bookmaking. These are defamiliarization, characterization, imagery, and setting. Of course, your creativity is not limited to these techniques alone, and we highly encourage you to look to other literary devices for more inspiration if needed. The application of literary devices to the development of artist books may seem, at first, like an extra and unnecessary step. But before one can become a book artist, one must learn the intricacies of language and writing. Like the five senses, literary devices can act as a catalyst for creative thinking. They are used to reinvent familiar ideas so that we may manipulate them into our own unique personal narratives. While it can be argued that some artist books lack text and therefore lack literary devices, it is impossible for any story to exist without them, for even when language is lacking, we can use materiality to develop meaning. This next book is quite the challenge to depict virtually. 
It is definitely one of those books that require you to be present in order to hold it and manipulate it. To truly read this book, one must interact with all the many components that come inside. That said, this book is a perfect example of how literary devices can be used to explore an artist's book. This is Rick Moody's Surplus Value Books, Catalog Number 13. And right off the bat, the most notable feature of the book is its structure. It is not a book as we understand it, but rather contains the narrative within its many parts. The rectangular box features a glass pane where the title and author's name are visible. The structure represents a door to a room. And when you open the book, you find a bound object, suggestive of a straitjacket. Before there is any reading, we are already beginning to understand a little bit about the setting, a mental hospital, and the characterization, a mental patient. This is done solely through the structure of the box and bound object. Surplus Value Books Catalog Number 13 is a deluxe edition presented as a collector's box containing several unique items. Upon opening the straitjacket, the text is found in the form of galley proofs. The collectible objects in the box act as a literal illustration of imagery. Themes of value, voyeurism, and deceit are presented as a pathology of collecting through the multiple layering of information and the revealing of objects of desire that are contained in this collector's box. This unique way of reading defamiliarizes our concept of what a book is and how a story is supposed to be told, proving that there are many ways to go about making a book. I have already briefly mentioned how the style and appearance of text on a page can influence a reader's experience. The text can be manipulated structurally through size, shape, color, and orientation, allowing your book to be read on more than one level. Manipulating typography is one of the easier techniques of book arts, especially if you have access to a computer and printer, both of which are available in our university library. In addition, you can also apply your drawing skills and imitate typefaces by hand with just pen and paper. Next is materials. The true beauty of art is that it is accessible to just about anyone, and oftentimes it can be found right before our eyes. In fact, recycling paper is considered both a cost-effective and creative way to making artist books. Scraps from flyers, magazines, photographs, notebooks, and even old books can be repurposed in a variety of ways to help you develop a structure and design unique to you. In addition, you can also check out your local craft store to find paper of different sizes, textures, and colors. Depending on the materials and equipment that are available, you can explore the structural aspect of the book and decide whether it will take the standard form or become something more abstract and physically challenging. This can include cutting, folding, binding, pasting, flipping, and erasing. These techniques are certainly aesthetically interesting, but they also work to force us into questioning our approach to reading. Zines and digital books are other examples of innovative bookmaking. A simple search online can provide many examples of such work. One of my favorite digital books is David Clark's 88 Constellations for Wittgenstein. Many other modern day book artists have begun using the digital format in order to widen the demographic of readers across a much larger scope. On a more basic scale, digital formats can also be created through a combination of music, blogs, and homemade videos. A great example of exploring and combining different methods of production can be found in Barbara Tenenbaum's Mining My Antonia. This book was inspired by a different book, Willa Cather's My Antonia, published in 1918. Tenenbaum's book is housed within a cloth cover. The book itself is also bound in reproduction fabrics from the late 1800s. The material is soft, flexible, and maybe even alludes to the feminine, while the floral patterns on the fabric can allude to nostalgia, nature, the pastoral. Upon opening the book, the reader encounters different colors of pages, and pages cut to different sizes, variations in typography, and even material. The book contains excerpted text from the Cather's novel, and also includes pull-out maps and a five automatic drawings done by Kathy Kuhn. 
As we have uncovered, there is really no limit to how you choose to present your artist books. There is only a guide to help you come up with inspiration and ideas along the way. Furthermore, it's important to understand that it only takes a little bit of creativity and not a lot of money to take advantage of the resources, materials, and equipment available to you. We have described how simple changes in typography can influence the meaning of a text in an immense way, and how recycled paper can be used to develop unique visual style and form. Also, how altering your book by cutting, folding, and binding can enhance the reading experience for adults and children alike, and how zines and digital books can help a book artist reach larger audiences. In whole, we have redefined what it means to read a book by applying certain literary techniques to these methods and developing a new relationship between language, literature, art, and culture. Now it's time for each of you to take the stories you've worked on and written and reinvent them into your own artist book creations. Creativity is not an endeavor we should take on alone, and it is through the participation of many people, many languages, and many cultures that we gain inspiration to create art. We hope that you share your stories among your friends, family, and peers, and if you'd like to share your artist book with us and be featured on our blog, Open Book, follow the link and send us an email.